Hello and welcome to What's Tom Reading? I'm Tom and this week I read By Water Beneath the Walls, The Rise of the Navy Seals by Benjamin H. Milligan. Thanks for tuning in. Enjoy the show. All right, so as I said, today I'm going to be talking about the book By Water Beneath the Walls by Benjamin H. Milligan. The subtitle of this book, as I mentioned, is The Rise of the Navy Seals. And full disclosure, before I even start to review this book, um, I heard about it from another podcast that is a very prominent podcast that you've probably heard of um, by former Navy SEAL Jocko Willink, who is a super cool dude with a super cool podcast. If you haven't heard his podcast before, it's a way better one than this one and you should definitely check it out he's like a super tough and intimidating dude and he's like too close to the microphone when he talks but man does that guy have some interesting stories to tell uh huge fan so on his show jocko had the author of this book um Ben Milligan is his name uh, on his podcast. And they talked a little bit about the Navy SEALs and a little bit about the book. And by the end of the podcast, I was like, okay, so I'm buying this book and reading it right now. So I did. And I got to say, I was not disappointed at all. This is a hefty old tome of like awesome war stories, cool characters, hard charging action. It's great. The author, uh, Milligan, a former SEAL himself, is obviously in love with the subject. It's kind of a passion project of his. Um, it, it's a labor of love for him to document the, the subject of how his beloved SEAL teams, the SEAL teams came to be. And his painstaking research is evident throughout the book, as well as his passion for the subject, you know, um, it's clear that he, the author spent like, uh, like a billion hours piling through old documents and correspondence from, you know, ancient theaters of battle, not ancient, but, you know, ancient by my standards in 1920s, 30s, 40s and such, <laughs> um, just old correspondence from old theaters of battle between the key characters of this story on, on how the seals came to be. And he did an excellent job of compiling all that information and putting it together into a book that, that I found just awesome. And it's, you know, in spite of the historical nature and the fact that he had to do a ton of research for it, um, this is not a dry, dusty history book by any means. In fact, at times, it's like a fly by the seat of your pants action thriller full of the, these colorful characters and vivid, sometimes, I mean, often horrific scenes of, of uh, intense fighting. Uh, I was at the edge of my seat and on the brink of tears a couple of times throughout the book. And in fact, the the combination of exceptional research and talented writing makes this book um, a little bit hard for me to place as far as genres go. I'd say that it reads almost more like a historical fiction, but it's actually a factual account. It's very interesting and very strange. Normally, the straight nonfiction books aren't as entertaining to read, um, but but Milligan paints just such beautiful pictures of these, these epic battle scenes that you can't help but be transfixed throughout the books. Now, I, I should preface this, this whole thing here with a, the disclaimer that I am a super big military history buff. Um, and take that with a big pinch of salt, as I say, um, because as time goes on and uh, if you stick with the podcast, if you listen to more of my book reviews, you'll see just how little it means for me to say that I'm an anything buff since I tend to read and get excited about like a stupidly broad array of different topics. Um, I'm just I'm just into learning about different things. But military history is a well that I come back to drink from again and again. I cannot help myself. I just love a good war story. And this book is chock full of awesome war stories. And if, if you're into that sort of thing, I'd highly recommend that you pick up the book and get busy reading it. It's um, it's not the easiest read. You know, it, it's a big book. It's intimidating, but it's unlike anything that I've read before, as I said, because of the way that it just blurs the line between this traditional nonfiction account of things as they happened and like the stylized rendition of many, many awesome epic battle scenes. Just get the book. OK, just do it now. Um, 
So as I review this book, I'm going to try to avoid directly quoting lengthy passages from the book. And that's a general rule for me for for all books, with the exception of like old books that I read where the purpose is the author's specific wisdom and turn of phrase. Um, Where possible, though, I'm going to try to avoid just quoting at length. Um, and I do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, I don't think that that style of podcast is particularly entertaining since at that point you might as well just go get the audio book and listen to it like from a professional narrator. Um, and in the context of the book itself, you don't need me to give you out of context quotes. Right. And second, I don't think it's fair to the author for me to cherry pick the juicy bits of his life's work and then publish them, um, because this is kind of an obscure book, right? Like, I, I don't know if you ever heard of it before uh, listening to this podcast, unless you heard of it, like I said, from the Jocko podcast. But I, if you hadn't heard of it from here or from there, I doubt that you have heard of it at all. And so I'm, I don't want to like steal this author's thunder. I, I want you to go get the book and read it because it's amazing. He deserves for you to go pick up his book and read it. Um, a, a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of his. So uh, with with that in mind, I'm going to try to stick to sort of higher level concepts and like a general overview and vibe of the book, along with some of my key takeaways and recommendations. Um, that way I don't kind of, you know, just just take what's special about the book and regurgitate it to you. So, um, so, so let's just get into it. Right. And again, I have to stress as I'm talking about the things that I like about the book, um, just how pleasantly surprised I was by the quality of the writing. You know, I've read books written by former soldiers and no offense because they're excellent books and excellent people, but they tend to be a little on the dry side, right? There's this military precision and tendency to not want to like bandy around extra words in order to get the job done. They want to be efficient. Right. Um, and, and I can respect that, but Milligan, although, uh, hardcore, highly trained killing machine himself, right? Like he's a Navy SEAL. He seems to have a little bit of like the heart of a poet, you know, I gotta say, I really dig that the whole warrior poet vibe. Very cool. Right. Very, very neat. And so he, he does bring that hard line military precision to the table, but he also brings like a little flair for the dramatic that helps to bring his stories or the stories that he tells in the book to life, you feel like you're there, you know, and I will admit, I will, I will admit fully that the quality of the author isn't what drew me to the book initially. Like I said, I've been down the road of reading books by former military men, and I was prepared for like a no nonsense brief style depiction of the subject matter as it is with no fluff and no frills, but the skill with which Milligan describes the physical characteristics of the key figures, as well as, like that 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 critical space time component of writing an action scene just kept me glued to this book in spite of its monstrous size from beginning to end right like like his descriptions of the characters um uh, uh, like i said i'm not going to directly quote right because i don't want to spoil any of it but he he's he describes the characters in such a fun and engaging way that you feel like you really just know the people he's talking about right he describes their face and he uses verbiage that that just makes these characters sound so familiar. They seem like somebody that you, that you knew growing up and you kind of get that picture in your head and, and the picture fascinatingly, um, it stays with you as you read. And I haven't, I have never read a book by a nonfiction author, or I should say, I've never read a nonfiction book where the character descriptions actually stay with you throughout the book as you're reading, right? A lot of times, um, you know, I'll either have seen a picture of the historical figure and that's what I'll use for for my my um, reference point on what they look like. Or I'll just like forget what the author said about how they looked and I'll just like copy and paste my own kind of impression or like a person that I know on top. Of. I don't know how you do it, but with me, um, it, it's usually the fiction books and particularly fantasy fiction books where the authors do, I think the best job in describing what your characters look like. And, and you, they give you detail about their hair color, their eye color, the shape of their chin, the, you know, their jawline, their, how long their hair is their you know, their posture, their, this, their, that, you know, it's a, it's a, an amazing, um, It's an amazing thing then for me to have gotten that type of character description from 
a nonfiction book where where you do know their hair color, their eye color, the the shape of their jaw. You know, one character is described as having his arms constantly cocked back, um, like like he's getting ready to throw a punch. And you just picture him and like this short guy, this high tempered, high strung guy. And you just picture this guy, and that picture of him stays with you as you learn about the things that he did. And the you know, so as he's doing these heroic things, you that picture sticks with you. And I know I keep coming back to it, and I I feel like maybe I'm starting to beat a dead horse here, but it, it was just so unusual for me for that to be the case that, that I really appreciated it. And I not only appreciated it once, but I appreciated it again and again and again as more characters were introduced. And as the author took that time to describe what they looked like, you know, and these were real people whose, whose pictures you can look up and his, his descriptions are dead on. It's awesome. That is such a talent um, and, and such a rare talent in a nonfiction setting that I have to mention it here that, that I loved that. I really, really loved that. Um, what I also loved was that um, the other thing that, that I've never heard from a nonfiction author and that I, I think particularly fantasy fiction or, or um, even like uh, action novels tend to get really, Right. And that's that's the way that a battle scene unfolds in space and time um, as you're reading it. And that's such a hard thing to do. If you ever tried to write a battle scene, I, I, I'm i like a, an amateur aspiring author. I'm garbage. Um, but I've tried to write battle scenes before and it's so difficult because you have this linear format you're doing one word at a time, one line at a time, one sentence at a time. But you're trying to describe you know, chaos and, and tons of things happening all at once and trying to give the the reader that feel that the, the, the bullets are flying or whatever and, and things are happening and bodies are moving and they're crashing into each other and people are hitting the ground and they're screaming and blah, blah, blah. You know, like you, you're trying to you're trying to get that that big, you know, Steven Spielberg, you know, Michael Bay director action going in your action scenes where like, you know, crack, crack, things are happening. <laughs> I don't know a better way to describe it than to say crack, crop, but, um, you know, things are happening and it's so hard to do in the written medium because like I said, one word at a time, one line at a time, it, it takes a lot of skill for you to get the pacing right on something like that. And Milligan nails it. He just, he crushes it in this nonfiction military history tome. There's these battle scenes that you could swear were written by a, like a first rate screenwriter or, or like a, like a fiction author or something like it's it's amazing what he's able to do, the way he's able to describe the way that these soldiers are moving in relation to each other and and, and that there's chaos all around them. And that he describes the way that the enemy are moving. And you feel like you just have a really good idea of where they are in space and time during these battle scenes. And that that's a rare thing. That's a rare thing um, for anyone to be able to do that in any genre. It's particularly rare in the nonfiction genre. And I loved that. Like, like I can't stress how much. I loved that about this book. The The battle scenes were so rich and they involved characters that were rich because of the time that he took to make them rich. And so all these stories about how the seals came to be, you know, they could have just been in brief form and, and you could find that pretty much anywhere. Right. Like, um, you know, the admirals uh, wanted a seat at the table. They felt like they were second class citizens uh, at the briefing tables because they didn't have a reactionary force or an expeditionary force that they could use on a battlefield. You know, the Viet Cong didn't have a Navy. So what were the admirals supposed to do? Um, so, you know, you could have you know, they could have stuck to the bare facts about like why the Navy SEALs were created and the bare facts about like the first tries that they had right with the underwater demolition teams who were supposed to like clear mines and, 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 um, you know, do, um, surveys of, of like amphibious landing sites or whatever to find out where the obstacles were and how deep the water was or, you know, hydrographics or whatever, you know, like it could have been so straightforward. It could have been very much like, here's the person who did this. Here's the training that he had. He was given this mission. He went and executed it on this day. And at this time, and he, you know, they, they took this many casualties and blah, 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 blah. Right. Like military history books tend to be more like that, where, you know, you get the bare bones facts and then your imagination kind of has to fill in the gaps. But but this 
this book is different than that, right? Because you do get the bare bones facts. You get all of the background information you could possibly ever want to have about this subject. You, you know, you know, everybody at any level of decision that that's determining these missions and these teams and, and who the men are. And you get, you get a really good sense of um, all of the background, top to bottom, you know, front to back from the president on down to like the lowest ranking member of the team itself. Like, you know, kind of where everyone stands at any given point. But on top of that, you get to actually live it with them through the skill of this author who who sets up all the background information and then he takes you there and you experience it. It's um, it's something that made this book sincerely unique. And for that reason alone, I recommend that you pick it up. But, you know, the, the Navy SEALs are obviously legendary. If you know anything about the military, you've heard about the SEALs before. You know that they're like legendary, BA, awesome, ultra fighter killing machine commando types who are like the elite forces of the world. There aren't many, you know, units out there in the world who can, who can compete with them. If any, I don't know if there are, if there are or whatever, but like they're supposed to be the best of the best. Their training is grueling. It's hardcore. In fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about their training here in a minute, because that's one of the things that really, really stood out to me in the book. But like, you know, you, you get the, you know who the seals are, if you know anything about the military, but this book, you get to know individual seals and you get to know individual seals in action. And that to me was awesome. It was like, it, it made, it gave me chills throughout because, you know, you hear about these guys and their families back home. And, and this one guy, you know, he's, he's got a, he's got a wife and kids back home and he's a point man walking through the jungle in Vietnam and he walks out into a clearing and boom, he just gets mowed down, mowed down by a machine gun and all the seals, they, they fan out, they hit the deck, they fan out, they try to pull themselves into a firing line and, and, and they're, they're really trying to, you know, uh, force their way up so that they can save this guy who's just been mowed down by this machine gun. And, and you know, the guy, right, you know him and he's there and you kind of, you get the sense of the loss and you know, the camaraderie that the team has built up and you know how they feel during the firefight as they're, they're desperately trying to get to their comrade. Right. And, um, you know, eventually one of the seals with an awesome shot gets, gets a, 40 millimeter grenade launched at towards the enemy that it suppresses them, knocks them out of the fight for a little while. And then this big dude who, you know, is a big dude because it's, he's been described to you before he's strong, he's tanky, he's brave. You've, you've seen him before in other scenes, he gets up, sprints over to his fallen comrade, scoops him up and then runs out of the jungle there, hightails it out. They get him back to, um, to, to safety and he's alive just long enough to, to say um, his final goodbye for his wife and his family. And, and then that's it. He's, he's dead. He's gone. And you feel that loss. You feel it. You know, I, I, I would not ever presume it's one thing, you know, you would never want to presume to, to be um, a part of the seal team unless you had earned it through, through the way that they have to earn it. And so I would never ever presume to, to say that I felt like one of them there, but, but that you have this, hum, this human connection with these warriors. And when one of them goes, when one of them dies, um, you feel it, you, you really, you really do. And, and so, um, I, I loved that aspect of the book as well. You get this, this, this big overview, but then you actually get to get down into the dirt and the sweat and the blood in the jungle with these guys who are actually doing what the guys up the chain of command are talking about putting into action. And it's beautiful. It's awesome. Um, my favorite. So as I said before, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about like what makes a seal, like what they have to go through, because that's that's something that's mentioned in the book about how their training evolves and how their selection process evolves. And and I guess I can just go back to kind of the beginning. There's this analogy where where war breaks out and they they uh, all the young men in the country. It's during a super patriotic time in American history. All these men flock to enlist. They flock to be a part of it. They want to go fight. They want to go go you know do their duty. And um, 
um, you're introduced early on in the book to these guys who are these pro football players and they're huge. They're, they're these beefy big dudes and they're, they're, um, super fit, super strong. A lot of them are like literally like professional football players, right? Like, like come, they came out of college. One of them I think was playing for like the Cleveland Browns or something like that. Like these pro football players who go to try and join the war effort. And there's this one guy, he, he tries to join the army and he, the, he gets rejected, right? Because he, he wants to join the, the paratrooper corps and jump out of airplanes. And the, the recruiter looks at him and he's this freaking huge guy. And he looks at him and he says, I could take two instead of you. Right. He's so big that, and the, the author Milligan, he, he makes it clear that like literally at that time, the average size of person would have been about half the size of this guy. Right. So like it literally would have been, he, he was taking up two seats on the plane for the price of one and the army just wasn't into that. So this guy, he has to go over to the Navy where they're a little bit less uh, concerned about um, <laughs> the, the, the size of their soldiers. There's more space on ships than airplanes, I guess. I, I, I don't know. Um, and so the Navy takes him, but he, he kind of gets assigned to, to be like a, like, it sounds like kind of like a calisthenics instructor or something like that. Like he's like trying to like improve the physical fitness of the sailors um, because a bunch of them are chubby and like out of regulation for their uniforms and their bellies are hanging over their belts and all this stuff like that. Like, um, so he gets to be like this calisthenics instructor or something like that and uh, hates it. Obviously he wanted to go fight. Um, and eventually he kind of gets, um, he kind of becomes associated with this, this other group of people who are like him, just big dudes who are super huge and in shape and really strong. And they're running like this calisthenics unit. Um, and they get kind of called in though, because somebody gets the bright idea, like, Hey, we should be like using these tanks to do tank work. Um, like we can, we can have them, you know, these guys could, could carry a pack the size of a man through the jungle for, 10 miles a day or whatever and be just fine. Right. Like the, the, we should be using these guys. And so they bring them all together and they call them, I think oh, they call them, Oh, they call them the tuna fish, which that's, the, that's awesome. Uh, cause they're, they're huge, I guess. Um, and they start to start to train them and, the guy who comes up with the training and, and the seals, they call their training, they call it buds, B U D S it's basic underwater demolitions and, strategy or something like that anyways it's, it's called buds and it it starts with what's called hell week and hell week um it's it sounds like it's about as nice as hell week sounds it should be right like i mean it sounds pretty awful um it a lot of running a lot of swimming um a lot of basically drowning um they they make you carry rafts over your head over sand dunes for miles and miles like these guys are they're getting put through this grueling rigorous ordeal and um it, you got to be like a you got to be a tough dude to be able to handle it um and, and you know it talks about how like they're they're so cold at night um after doing their their nighttime swimming exercises or whatever they have to spend the night on the beach and they're so cold that they're laying there on sand um and, and like somebody's like these commanders are like shooting like live ammunition over their heads and blowing up chunks of the beach next to them and like really trying to give them like this hellish experience of of battle and they're laying there on the sand like just shivering just freezing their butts off and th they're shivering while they've got like sand in their groins and in their armpits and stuff like that like in, in like the you know, their you know crotch and armpits and the shivering is making that sand into like an abrasive like sandpaper almost in those crevices and just rubbing them raw and bloody and they're sitting there and they can't move and they can't quit and like oh man the the ordeal that these guys go through they have to be in just peak immaculate physical condition so strong so fast so tough so psychologically intense and willing to put up with just like just like the worst kind of, of hell. Um, these guys, the training they go through, um, it, it's what makes them the best of the best before they even start to like learn tactics and learn how to, um, like be soldiers or, or seals like, like, like 
before they start doing any military whatever, they got to go through this crucible to just prove that they are tough enough to even be able to handle it. And for me, um, I think that's probably what makes a seal a seal. And hearing about that, and then and then after you've heard about it, seeing how these men react when they're under fire and in combat, you're like, yeah, okay, these guys are the best of the best. I don't want to mess with them, but I love to hear about their stories and their antics. And I I am not putting this book down right. So those are the things that I mostly loved about the book. There's a lot to love about it. There's a lot of really specific, um, battle stories that I, like I said, I'm not going to spoil any of the specific quotes. Um, but like you get stuff from world war one, you get stuff from world war two, you get stuff from the Korean war. You get a lot of stuff from Vietnam as you know, the seals finally kind of step into their own role there. And then you get just kind of, it kind of, kind of finishes there at Vietnam. Um, because there are other books that pick up, um, about the seals in, uh, like Afghanistan and Iraq and stuff like that, that, that I might recommend to you as well. Um, American sniper is one of those books that I read not that long ago that I actually might go back and review because it was dope. Um, but you know, it's, I, I won't, I won't inundate you with too much military history in a row here. So I might skip a few books and then go back to that one, um, someday, but yeah, those are the things I liked. Um, it's great stories, really, really interesting. And then the way that the story is told, especially, is is what I loved. So let's head on over to our corners. Um, today, uh, like I said, we've made some changes. So we're going science corner, learning corner, trivia corner. Let's hit it. All right, so we are at here at the science corner, and I wanted to talk today about. Um, I guess the field would be uh, physical sciences, material science. I don't know what you'd want to call this. I can't, maybe it's mechanical engineering again. Am I am I super into mechanical engineering? No, that can't be it. Uh, but anyways, we're we're talking about so technology as anyone who is familiar with the world knows um, has been advancing at kind of a fast clip lately, particularly in the area of computer sciences. But I feel like it's really overshadowed kind of a place where we've made, I think as uh, like as a people, as humanity, some of our biggest gains. And that is in the field of materials science. Um, most of you have probably heard about 3d printing, um, you know, kind of injecting, um, plastics in in a preset kind of way um, through a computer program to to make something that's a three dimensional object print it out right. Um, but we're actually getting super super good at three D printing, and now we can print things out of metal like titanium even, and that is so cool because it gives us um, it, it gives us advantages in engineering that I don't think most people can even fully comprehend, right? Because, um, the parts that you make, uh, that, that we make for the different applications that we make parts for, they have to be either molded, which means you pour hot molten metal into a mold. And then when it cools, it's the shape of the mold, um, or machined at, which means you have to have tools that can like drills and presses and things like that, that can, that can shape the metal while it's cooler. Um, sometimes they shape it while it's hot, but, um, or, or like drill into it and core some of it out. Basically the, the limitations that we've had in materials production and producing our parts are that things have to be, um, either the shape of a mold or reachable by tools, right? We can't, so it makes it really hard to make certain shapes, particularly like curved shapes, right? Like um, shapes that have internal curves are really difficult to do because most drill bits, as you know, don't curve very well. But with 3D printing, we're able to, to make these shapes in ways that we never have been able to before. And now that we can do it out of titanium, we're in like, we're in serious business, right? Like we can do tons and tons of cool stuff. Um, and kind of along that, that same line, we're also, um, improving our ability to produce things with like composite materials, like carbon fiber, uh, composites where, you know, carbon fiber is a strand of carbon that's, you know, 10 ish times thinner than a human hair, um, and super flexible, but it's like, we've got a ton of tensile strength, which means that you can pull on it really hard and it won't break. Um, you know, 
ounce for ounce that's about five times stronger than steel in its tensile strength um but it's super flexible not very rigid so the way that we've been making it into composites that are useful is we we mix it with a plastic resin that kind of gives it rigidity and then the carbon fiber gives it gives it strength so in in some ways we're building what's essentially like tiny 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 concrete things that like where the, the concrete is the plastic resin and the rebar that goes inside the concrete to give it that extra strength is like our carbon fibers. And so we're, we're building very, very, very small, very fine, very strong materials that are super lightweight and incredibly strong. And um, I had the opportunity to hear a pitch from a from a business that uh, obviously there's a non-disclosure agreement in place, so I can't talk about it in detail, but that is implementing this carbon fiber technology to do some super, super cool stuff. So just, I mean, keep your head up, be aware of those changes in the scientific world and, and do some research about it because between 3d printing, um, metal and, um, carbon fiber composites, we're doing some insanely cool stuff, particularly look into the field of like, uh, aeronautics, right? Like, like airplanes and things like that. That's, I think where some of the coolest gains are happening. So, um, that's it. That's it for the science corner. All right. And now we're over to the history corner. And I think this is a doozy. In fact, this is one of the coolest things um, that I've heard about history in a super long time. And I, I heard it from two different sources kind of um, simultaneously and never before in my life. So I think it might be just kind of like rattling around out there in the zeitgeist. So you might have stumbled upon it, too, in the same way that I had. But, man, I just, I just want to talk about it. Um, the ancient Greeks just totally didn't have a word for blue turns out and they're not alone turns out like a lot of ancient cultures don't have a word for blue which is just nuts it's nuts and the way that they kind of figured this out is that like it, i guess in the odyssey homer um and and in the iliad he he uses a bunch of colors right like um black and white and red and yellow and green he uses those um but he doesn't <laughs> he doesn't ever use blue and he talks about the sky and, and they use like a shade of black to describe the sky always. Um, and he talks about like the wine, dark sea. Um, and, and the sea is not the color of wine. Wine is purple. Homer, don't you know that? Um, it seems like they maybe didn't have a color for blue and kind of crazy. They also didn't seem to notice that they didn't have a color for for blue and that that like just blows my mind right but if you think about it and the way that i one video i saw described it um the only reason we have a word for pink which is just a shade of red is that we decided that pink exists and that there's a reason to differentiate between that shade of red so like maybe just the ancient greeks and other ancient cultures as well right like the bible um the old testament and and you know the new testament i guess uh, just don't mention blue that often or if uh, at all right um and the the going theory is that every culture needs to know what black and white are you know day and night and then red is like the color of blood and different things that you know meat and different things that we associate with um tomatoes apples right uh green is you know grass and fields and different things that are right there with us and uh, I guess yellow as well. I don't, I don't know the theory. I think those theories are lame. Um, I think maybe they just forgot to make blue a thing and they were just like, yeah, it's the sky. It's, it's whatever it's, you know, it doesn't need to have a color. Uh, it's the, it's the ocean It's ocean colored. Why would we need to describe ocean colored? Uh, so <laughs> I, I think, I think, um, what's kind of super crazy about this is that by making the color blue up, we now have not only blue, but we also have like a bunch of different perceptions of different shades of blue that the ancients wouldn't even have like been aware of. Like they would have been able to see those colors. It's not like they were colorblind, but they wouldn't have like named them or sorted them or been able to necessarily differentiate between like blue and turquoise as well as we can. But like we've kind of programmed our brains to be able to see those different hues. And so I guess maybe this is a history slash science one. But I just thought that was super cool and maybe I'm butchering it. But if you get a chance, look into this idea that the ancients didn't have blue um, because I just I found that super, super fascinating. All right, we're done with the learning corner and we're moving on to the trivia corner. Mm. 
<laughs> so I was recently talking to my dog, whose name is Rudy, and he's a good boy. Um, and I was thinking, oh man, what should I include in the trivia section of this episode of my podcast? And I asked Rudy and he looked at me just like a dumb look, like how he always does whenever I ask him anything. Um, he's not a great conversationalist turns out, but it got me thinking, maybe I should just like toss out a couple of random facts about dogs. Would you be interested in that? I, I find it super interesting. So I looked up. Uh, from the American Kennel Club, just some very interesting dog facts. And so here we go. Uh, I think I think it's cool. Um, did you know that a dog's nose print is unique, like how a finger, like a person's fingerprint is unique? I guess dogs have nose prints and you can use those to track down dogs who have committed crimes against humanity. Um, it, it, apparently, it's very effective for that purpose. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what purpose you would have to use a dog's nose print, but they have those. Um and, and so, yeah, pff, cool, right? Um, did you know that a dog has a sense of smell that is way better than ours? Of course you did. Everyone knows that. Did you know that it's 60 times better than ours? Based off of the number of receptors they have in their nose, they, we, they have 300 million receptors and we have like 5 million. They apparently smell stuff way better than we smell stuff. They definitely don't smell better than we smell, at least in my opinion. Um, but... Yeah, they, they have that great sense of smell. I, I don't know why th that's in a fact that I would include since everyone seems to really know that. But did you know that dogs' noses can sense heat and thermal radiation? Bet you didn't know that. That's how your blind, deaf, ancient dog is getting around is he totally knows where things are. And uh, how about this one? Did you know that yawning is contagious even for dogs and that the sound of a human yawn can trigger a yawn from a dog and it's four times as likely to happen when it's the yawn of a person that the dog knows hmm did you know that did you know that the reason the dogs curl up in a ball when sleeping is to protect their organs which is a holdover from their days in the wild where they were vulnerable to predator attacks okay all right that's a bit of a stretch american kennel club there's no way that you could know that maybe they curl up into a ball because it's warmer right protect their organs I mean, the entire middle part of the dog is organs. Okay. I think we're done with dog facts. Um, but yeah, hopefully you enjoyed these, these dog facts. Um, yeah. Let's get back to the book before I give you any more dog stuff. Oh, dogs are not colorblind. What? They can see blue and yellow. So dogs, unlike ancient Greeks, have blue. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Step it up, ancient Greeks. Okay, so we are back to our review of By Water Beneath the Walls, The Rise of the Navy Seals. And now we get to do the not so fun part of this podcast, which is where I talk about the things that I did not like so much about the book. And it pains me to do this, so I'm going to keep it short. But. I feel like I have to, right? I feel like I, in order for me to give a fair review of these books, I have to have a section dedicated to kind of picking them apart and talking about the things that I did not find super enchanting about the book. So here we go. In spite of all of the love that I just piled onto this book, now you're going to hear the dirty, painful, ugly truth. And that is that this book was kind of boring. I said it. I, I regret it as soon as I say it. it. It pains me, especially given that I just talked up all these epic battle scenes and these amazing character development, um, particularly for a nonfiction. But this book is huge and it covers a lot of space and a lot of time and a lot of people. And I there were a few times where I was just, you know, sitting there reading and my eyes would glaze over and I'd be like, Oh boy, I do not care as much about this Admiral's particular correspondence during this particular week of the war as I thought I might before I started reading about it. Or, Oh boy, I do not care about this guy's like time in as an instructor at buds or whatever, as much as I thought I would. Um, so it, it's interspersed with amazing epic battle scenes and super cool character development development but whew, i mean it is i'm sorry for blowing the microphone there i whistled let's try that again 
There we go. Um, it is tear jerkingly boring at times. Um, and and uh, uh, I feel so bad to say that because it's, it's primary purpose, right? Is as a nonfiction historical kind of, uh, documentary of the rise of an important branch of the U S military. Of course, there's going to be a lot of sections of bureaucracy because that's what the military is. It's a giant, it's the grinding bureaucracy of applied violence, right? Like uh, without, without all of the tedium, we wouldn't be able to have, you know, the, the front line epic battles, um, without, you know, all the beam counting and, um, packaging and whatnot that goes behind the scenes. So that's kind of, uh, including that I feel like is necessary. And so I don't criticize the author for doing that. It just was painful to be a part of if I'm honest, um, during different parts of the book. So if I have one criticism, that's it. It just wasn't a thrill ride the whole time. Um, and yeah, there you have it. So without further ado, let's jump into my patented, amazing, super fantastical, um, five star, five bell system of whatever. I'm going to come up with a better way to describe this, but anyways, here we go. That's right, guys. I gave this book by water beneath the walls by Benjamin Million four stars because I thought it was awesome. I thought it was a great book. Um, there were no major downsides. I, the The only downside was that it was boring and I expected it to be boring going in. Right. I picked up a giant, giant, giant book on military history and I thought, Hmm, this is going to be a tearjerker. This is going to be boring. Um, and it was at some parts, but man, the, the ride that he gives you um, in between is just amazing, right? Like you get such cool scenes. You get such cool character development. Definitely. If you're a a military history buff, if you're into this kind of thing, pick up this book sometime and read it. It's so cool. It was a really, really good time. I learned a lot. I gained a lot of respect for the men who, uh, form the seal teams. These guys are tough. They're the real deal. Um, so yeah, That's it. That's it for today's review. Um, Now let's just let's finish up with today's parting thought. Um, And as we go, you'll probably discover that I'm, I'm a fan of stoic philosophy and the stoics basically believed in, in um, just trying to get to that, that Zen place where you can just accept the world around you. Um, it, it doesn't mean you don't fight, right? Like the Stokes were big believers in fighting for what they think is right. And for, uh, and for yourself and, you know, working hard and pushing yourself. But the idea was to kind of accept things as they come and, and be, uh, stoic about it, I guess is the best way to describe it. I'll come up with a better des- way to describe it sometime, but maybe this will give you an idea of some of what they think. So this one, uh, this quote comes from Marcus Aurelius, uh, in his book meditations. I'm a huge fan. And it, uh, this is a translation obviously from, from the, the Latin that he wrote it in. Um, but it, it says be tolerant with others and strict with yourself. And reading this, it really resonated with me because, man, don't we just do the opposite in today's day and age? I don't want to be like kids today because I'm a young man, but like, you know, be tolerant with others and strict with yourself. There's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of preaching of tolerance now, but not a lot of practicing of tolerance. If you've noticed. Right. It's it's amazing how intolerant the the proponents of tolerance tend to be of different viewpoints. Right. So, um, the idea behind this is that you should be tolerant with others, accept them as they are, accept their shortcomings, accept who they are and what they, what they believe in and what they want out of life, accept that, but be strict with yourself, you know, set goals for yourself, set priorities for yourself, set standards for yourself. And don't, don't, allow yourself to get off the hook for not meeting those standards, right? Too often we're strict with other people where we, we say, no, these are the standards and you have to abide by them. But when we slip up, we, we expect tolerance and we give tolerance to ourselves. And then we demand that tolerance of our shortcomings from others um, instead of being strict with ourselves and then expecting respect from others. There's a, di- there's a difference. And I think that difference is kind of the key difference in Stoic philosophy that really resonates with me. And th- I think the 
we could really use a heavy helping of in today's world, you know, let's let's be more strict with ourselves going forward, set goals, stick to them, and then be tolerant and understanding of other people, right? Um, love your neighbor, all that good stuff. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be a pushover. It doesn't mean that you don't stand up for what you believe in, but make sure that you're living it, right? Not that you're not just preaching it and expecting other people to live it. Make sure you yourself are living it before you go casting around for other people to be in charge of. So that's it for the day. I hope you enjoyed this show. I'll be back again soon with another book. Um, Thank you guys so much for listening. If you liked it, share it. Uh, If you didn't, let me know how I can improve it. I'd be happy for any feedback. Uh, And yeah, have a good day.